is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. Shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise. Borrowed for three days, his body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the grave. Our God has robbed the
All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son and forgave our sins. Let everything that has breath, let praise have breath, breath. Has breath. Let, let every breath has that has breath praise the praise the Lord. And when you believed in Christ, He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom He promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised, and that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify Him. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now He is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome to ACC. We invite you to stand with us this morning as we enter into a time of worship and praise our King.
Freeze cause you're sovereign Freeze cause you reign Freeze cause you rose and defeated the grave Freeze cause you're faithful Freeze cause you're true Freeze cause there's nobody greater than you Freeze cause you're sovereign Freeze cause you reign Freeze cause you rose and defeated the grave problem today. We have lots of people here, and um, so what we're going to ask is to make this like a movie theater, and if we could just squeeze close to the people beside us, that would be great if you're willing. If you're willing. I understand. I understand we have that. You know what? You guys didn't grow up in Toronto. Uh, I did, and when you took the subway, sometimes this was your space. You just stood like this, and so there was somebody right here sometimes. You're like, how's it going? <laughs> You know, not great. But if you don't know me, I'm Michael. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to be with you today. If you don't know, we just ended 40 days of prayer where, um, yeah, it's awesome. If you look, if you didn't know that we were, if you didn't know we were doing that, there's, there's a wall out there with all these little blue marks. And those were all representing someone who said yes to pray for 30-minute windows. And it went through the night. And so it's really cool that our town, really, of believers came together and began to pray for the things of God. And so we're really excited to go. We believe the Lord is going to do something. And what it will be, we don't know. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be super exciting. And as we look at Easter, we say, man, what an incredible time because this is the reason we have hope. Right? If you don't know, the reason we have hope is because Jesus is risen. He has conquered death so you and I no longer have to pay that penalty. And so if you don't know, uh, just a couple of things we got going on. We have a baptism coming up on April 4th. And this is why I would say this relates. Maybe you've said yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you said, God, can be the Savior of my life. But you've never been baptized. This is one of the requests of Christ to all believers. Believe and be baptized. So even as we go through the service today, I would just challenge you to say, Jesus, I have, you know, I haven't been baptized. Stir in my spirit if you're asking me to do that. I would encourage you to do that. And if you want to, come talk to one of the pastors uh, or go to the, front de- the, the, the welcome desk back there and just tell them that. Next, we have a marriage um, a conference. Is that what you call it? event not a conference that's too serious no (laughs) no we you know (laughs) we're doing a marriage event on april 5th so get baptized on april 4th and you come out feeling better then we can work on our marriage on the next day this is good news so this is going to be uh it's it's going to be a fun event from 7 to 8 30 ish is what's written it's kind of like youth you know youth ends at nine but it ends at like 10 30 you know so give or take the time and it's gonna what 11. 11 we have someone saying 11 do i have a 12 12 12 anybody okay okay so this is happening on april 5th don't get confused not 12 april 5th 
here at the church, 7 to 8.30. And the, it, it's going to be a day night, right? It's, you come out. No kids are allowed. There will be no kid care. But come on out. Um, there will be some snacks provided. Uh, and there will be lots of laughs. And come get to know some of the other couples here within the church. And if you want to come, I would just ask you to RSVP with Shauna, which you can find um, her number in the bulletin. So if you want to come to that, grab that in the bulletin, okay? So I can't tell you her number because I don't have it here in front of me. And finally, the, the, the only thing I'll just give a little update about is just some youth stuff. So you know, I say I'm one of the pastors here, but I work specifically with the youth. And if you're a youth in the room, we run youth every Wednesday at 7 till 9. And, and our heart at youth group is really to grow, show, know, and encounter the love of Jesus together. That is why we do it. And life, I would say, is better together. And I believe that those teen years are quite challenging times. I think if we all can reflect and look back, we can say that those are big question times, as well as finding good Christian community can be a challenge. And so if you're here in the room and you're a, you're a youth, I would just encourage you, man, if you, if you struggle with this, I, I feel lonely. I don't know the answers to life. I would just love to invite you to come join us as we seek to encounter the presence of Christ together, as well as be in community with one another. And this is the last thing I would say about it is for any youth in the room, I know it's a risk. I know it's a risk when you show up anywhere and you don't know nobody. Maybe you're here today at church and you're not a youth and you're an adult and you know nobody. If, there's a little bit of a daunting feeling that comes over our heart. But I would tell you this, that it's worth the risk. It's worth the risk to, to step into Christian community and, and be known and grow together in Christ. But with that, we're going to pray. So... Heavenly Father, thank you for what you have done on the cross for us. O oh, death, where is your sting? Lord Jesus, thank you that you rose from the dead. And because of what you did, we now have the opportunity to spend eternity with you. That we now have the opportunity of forgiveness of sin. We have opportunity of redemption where it was a hopeless circumstance. Now, Lord, we do not stand in that same standings anymore, but rather we have been freed because of what you have done. Thank you, Jesus, for each one who's here. And Lord, I pray as we're gathered around your name and how you have risen, how you have defeated death and its sting, we will bring praise to your name. Help us fix our eyes on you, Lord. And if there is any places that, any individuals here who, who, who are in a place of despair, Lord, would this be a day where you encounter them in those places? That they would see who you are and, and how you have overcome and that you meet us in these places. But bless each one here. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand with us again. To the cross I look. To the cross I cling. Of its suffering I do drink. Of its work I do sing. And don't it Savior, both bruised and crushed, show that God is love, and God is just.
across you beckon me draw me gently or to my knees and I am lost in Lord so lost in love I am sweetly broken holy surrender at the cross you beckon me draw me Without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, and dash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given. grew quiet, my feet rose to dance, when death was arrested and my life began. And oh, your grace is so free, washes over me, you have made me It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner of war. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully my death, and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, in my life began. Oh, 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 your grace is so free, watches over. Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But that's not where it ended. Amen. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested in our lives again. Oh, 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 your grace is so free. Watches over. Your name. 
thank you, Lord, that, uh, yeah, that you, you came and you gave of yourself freely for our sins, for what we've done, and you paid the price for that, Lord. I just thank you that there's freedom in your name. Lord, may you touch each one of us here this morning. May we feel your presence, and we, may we feel your love in a new way this morning, God. in the room I can see the scars of love upon his hands the king is in the room we watch the darkness flee at his command and who is this king who is this king his name is Jesus, His name is Jesus, light of the world, His freedom in His name, His awesome in power, His reigning forever, light of the world, His freedom in His name. healers in the room that miracles break out across this place saviors in the room so beyond the boundaries of his grace will there's resurrection power in his name
never been a love so great. It's never been a love so great. He died so we could live. Then he rose up from that grave. Name another king like this. Now all authority forever belongs to him. He reigns in victory. Name another king like this. Awesome in power, reigning forever, light of the world. There's freedom in his name. One more time, raise your voice. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus, light of the world. There's freedom in his name. It's awesome in power, reigning. Forever, light of the world, there's freedom in his name. Yeah, Jesus, we praise you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can call on your name, that you are the king, that there's no one like you, Lord Jesus. That, Lord, you saw all of us that we really are, the, the things that we think nobody has ever seen. And you've seen everything to the deepest parts of us. And you look at us and you, and you say you love us. I thank you for that love, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just praise your name. Thank you for what you have done. And we pray. Amen. Feel free to grab a seat. <clears throat> so we're about to go to, to a, have a giving moment. But before we get to, get to that, in Matthew 6, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but rather store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. And then it says, for where your treasures is, there your heart will be also. Something I love about that passage is it highlights a God-given opportunity to be an investor, right? An investor. You, you get to pour into an eternal kingdom. When our church decided, however, however many years ago, they said, we want to have youth in this building. This building immediately became marked by the youth. And what I mean is, they just think different. They don't think, I got a hockey stick in my hand and a puck. There's a wall. I'm going to shoot it at it. There are marks all over this church from them being here in this place. This beautiful black wall won't always look like this, folks. There's going to be divots and holes, and it will most likely be due to the fact that we have youth here. You know, a kid goes to catch a football, and he puts his, he puts his foot right through the wall, using it as a bounce-off opportunity to catch and because of it, this church is marked with the youth's presence <laughs> being here. And what God says to you and I, he says, you can be an investor into the things of heaven so your handprints, like our youth, will be marked in eternity. That's a pretty cool something. And that's what he looks at you and I and says, do you want to do that? Do you want to join in with us in being that person? Because it says, even for Christ, he had the opportunity to do something for us. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Right? What? The, the, the cross doesn't look all that enjoyable. But he was willing and ready to give with a joyful heart for what it meant. And Jesus looks at us and says, are you willing or are you willing to be an investor with a heart of gratitude into the eternal things. And so if you don't know, this place does not run on government funding. I think 0% almost kind of thing. But it comes from people's generosity. And so if we're going to go to this moment of giving, but I say there's offering boxes at the back, there's a machine at the back, but even in this moment, maybe you just sit and you pray, and say, God, is there something you want me to do? Whether financially or with your time, there's many ways to give. 
But just take that moment and just be before the Lord and say, God, how is it that you want to give? And even have a moment of gratitude saying, God, thank you for how you've given. And with that, I'll turn it over to that. Let's just have a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, as, uh, as we prepare to hear the word from Tim, Lord Jesus, I pray you would open our ears to receive from you. Thank you, Jesus, that no matter where any of us are at in this given moment, that we are not people without hope. But Lord, because of you, we are always in a place where we can have hope. Whether it's in a, in a marriage, whether it's in the sense of feeling lonely, whether it's stuck in an addiction, whether if it's, I've just never been able to be very faithful to you, Jesus. Maybe overcome by fear. Feeling uh, trapped because of an abuser. Or maybe because of some of the things that I know I've done wrong. But in every circumstance, Lord Jesus, when we come and we fall at the feet of you, thank you, Jesus, that you meet us. And thank you, Lord, that you see us exactly where you are. And you do not pull away from us. And maybe some of us here have been pulling away from you, Lord. We've been running the other direction. Lord Jesus, I pray for today that the power of your spirit would be at work in our hearts. That we would turn and look at our Savior. That we would turn and look at the one where there is the only place of hope that doesn't fade. That hope that always lasts. And the hope for a new start, new future, and an eternity is with you, Lord Jesus. And so if there's people here who feel that they've been far from you, God, today would be the day that they hear the call on their heart and they would turn to you, maybe for the first time, to call on you as Lord and Savior. Jesus, I pray for the silencing of the things that might be distracting. We pray against the voice of the enemy in this place. And God, we pray for a clarity of hearing your voice. Thank you, God, that you say that your sheep can hear your voice. To anybody who calls you Lord and Savior, you say we can hear your voice. So, Lord, in this place, I pray that there would be that sense, that belief around the truth of what that is. So, glory to your name, God. Bless Tim as he comes to preach. In your name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Shauna, and I just wanted to share some of my story with you. I grew up in a Christian home and asked Jesus into my heart as a young child. I'd always felt God's hand on my life and his blessings. I married my high school sweetheart right out of high school, and we started our family soon after. While I was pregnant with our second child, my older sister went missing. Nothing really prepares you for something like that and not knowing what, where she was was hard to handle. We came together as a family and we prayed and we prayed like we'd never prayed before. Three days later, she was found. She had taken her own life. No one knew the hurt she was feeling and the deep hole that she felt she couldn't get out of. I had lots of questions for God. Like he knew we would be praying for her 
He knew where she was. Why didn't he save her? I had so many questions and so many unanswered, no answers for those questions. I had to leave this one to God. I had to trust him. I had to believe that he could use this for his glory. Somehow, in some way, life goes on. I was busy with babies and I didn't have time to grieve. We moved from BC to Sylvan Lake uh, less than a year later. My parents were already living here with my younger brothers and it was a welcome and much needed change for our family. Life goes on and life has lots of struggles. I can remember one time we had no money for rent and we got a call that we had won a thousand dollars in a contest that neither of us ever remember entering. God is so good and he has a plan. He always has a plan, thank goodness, because where would we be without trusting his plan and his timing? Um, the years passed and my family, we, we kind of fell away from God. Um, my husband was in a secular band and every weekend he was playing and we rarely went to church anymore and we rarely spent time together. Uh, in the summer of 2013, my father-in-law, his heart began to fail. So, and the doctors had done all they could do. We watched this man of God sing his way into heaven, literally. He made sure all the doctors and nurses knew Jesus. It was a beautiful thing to watch him slip away into the arms of Jesus with the peace on his face. Our family was renewed. We began going to church again and getting back on track, spending time together and being a family. It was a wonderful and precious time that I'll never forget. Six weeks later, my husband was killed in a motorcycle accident. I went into a tailspin along with my kids. They were 19, 17, and 14 at the time. The shock is unimaginable, and the heartbreak is you feel like you can't even breathe or move or go on. I've never experienced that kind of pain. And there was that why question again. It never got answered. My faith, my love for Jesus was gone. Why would a loving God do this to my family? Why would he do this to me? My best friend, my strength, my life, my everything was wrapped up in my husband and I was totally lost without him. I had been a Christian my whole life and I didn't understand anything. I stepped away from my friends and my family and even my kids. I self-medicated with drinking, going to clubs and sleeping around. I was trying to stop the hurt with the things that were actually making it much worse. But praise the Lord, as joy comes in the morning, I have some amazing friends and family who prayed for me. One friend came alongside me and asked me to go to soul care to get with her. And I began to know the God I had served for so long. I mean, really, really began to know him. I had to rethink my view of Christ, not as someone who is only happy with me when I was good but as a loving father who hurt with me. God didn't take Craig away from me as punishment. That was a big lie I had to demolish. I was a child of the king. I had, I had to let that sink in. Through all my hurts and pain, Jesus never left my side. He was there the whole time, waiting, holding my hand, carrying me, loving me even when I didn't feel it or didn't know he was there. Praise the Lord, he was. All three of my children went to Bible school after graduating and they found healing in Christ as well and continue to, to feel healing. It's amazing when you give everything that you have left to Christ. The why questions don't really matter because you know God's got this. To really know the love of Christ and feel his presence is a new, was a new experience. Just the closeness that I'd never felt before. I decided to give him everything and die to self. And only in dying to self can we really find redemption in our, in our lives. Some time before, my mom had told me to get a pair of men's pants 
put them on the end of my bed and have a list of characteristics that I was looking for in a husband, put them in the pants, and pray over them every night. Well, I did that. And uh, I started noticing some guy coming around where the bank where I worked, and I'd seen him in different places, and oh boy. Uh, but I was content to let God do the work because I had made a mess of things in the past, heaven knows. And uh, yeah, I wanted God to take the wheel because he's a much better driver than I am anyways. And you know God has a sense of humor because the Hells Angels were actually part of us getting together. But that's a story for another time. We met over coffee one evening and you know he checked all the boxes in the, on the list on the, in those pants. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Another thing is, is he had the same name. They both were named Craig. They both were from Ireland and there's some other things. And yeah, he loves, he loves, he loves the Lord and my family. And he's a perfect fit for us. God continues to amaze us and work in our life and in, and in our family. God wants to show off if, if we let him, if we trust him. And I encourage you all to, to let God be amazing. Let God move in your life and you will see amazing things. Ephesians 3.20 says, To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. My name is Tim, one of the pastors here. Really great to be with you this Easter Sunday morning. And thank you to Shauna for sharing that testimony. I love the honesty of it. She talked about the brokenness of this life as well as the hope that can be found in Jesus. And that's really all we want to communicate today. Uh, the world is broken, but there's a new way in Christ. My parents took our family to Disneyland in the 1970s. I remember lots about that trip. I remember being along the Oregon coast and my first experience stepping in the ocean. It was pretty cool. I remember uh, snacking the entire trip on cheese slices and saltine crackers. I can only now enjoy them again after all these years. <laughs> I remember seeing the sign, the happiest place on earth. I mean, we'd watched the wonderful world of Disney at 6 p.m. on Sunday nights, and now we were there. It was pretty incredible. These are just a few of the amazing memories. There were so many of them. One other memory I'd like to share is, uh, had to do with driving in Los Angeles. We came from Revelstoke, population 8,000, to LA, population 9 million. The infrastructure and roadway systems were just a tad different between the two. We were driving around that concrete jungle in a Dodge maxi van with no air conditioning, trying to find the correct off-ramp amidst a myriad of possibilities. Mom had a paper map open on her lap, and Dad was asking where we should turn. It was crazy. It was a bigger challenge than they had the abilities to handle. Eventually, Dad just pulled over on the side of the freeway, and after looking at the map, Discerning where we were in relation to where we needed to go, he simply announced, we can't get there from here. <laughs> there were just too many lanes. All five kids, what? There was just too many lanes and directions that we had missed, and we were hopelessly off course. But fortunately, my dad is not like most dads. See, he wasn't going to let a million cars and the astoundingly huge and confusing cloverleaf overpasses dissuade him. I still remember being way up on this hill overlooking uh, where we needed to go and knowing there was no way we could get there. When my dad just threw that old van in to drive, turned the nose of the beast straight down the hill. We went totally off-road. This was the scene. American vehicles driving seamlessly in prescribed patterns and one blue Canadian maxi van going completely off course. He got down to the bottom of that hill and merged back onto the freeway. I don't know if he went over that freeway to another freeway, but eventually doing things his way and completely against the natural way of doing things, he got us to where we needed to go. Map schmap. Well, today we're going to be talking about a similar yet infinitely more critical off-course situation 
we're going to be talking about the reality of life on this planet and how impossible the hope of getting to heaven is by natural means. We simply can't get there from here. And we'll be talking about the amazing solution that has been provided uh, to remedy the problem. A solution that goes against the natural way of doing things. A remedy that turns the impossible into the possible. Paul describes two people in the passage we're going to look at today. And these two people create the foundation for why Easter Sunday is so critical to everything Christians believe in. The one person got humanity into all kinds of trouble. And the other person got humanity out. So we're going to be looking at Romans 5, verses 12 to 21. Here's what it says. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people. For before the law was in the Before the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a commandment, as did Adam, who is the pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, Overflow to the many. Again, the gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all people, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death, grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Two men, two very different outcomes. The first man is Adam. I'll put him up here, Adam. Okay, Adam... This is the one that was written about in Genesis 1. It says this, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. It seemed like a perfect situation. A beautiful garden, the Garden of Eden. A man and a woman perfectly suited for each other. A future of harmony with the earth and with the creatures of the earth. A personal and physical relationship with the God who created them. What could possibly go wrong? Well, Paul starts the passage by saying, Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. Something had gone bad way too soon. Adam rebelled against God. All that God had given him was not enough. It was not enough that all the trees in the garden were given to him. Adam wanted more. He wanted to eat from the one tree from which he was forbidden to eat. And he did. He disobeyed the loving God who had created him, had given him untold blessings and wonders and pleasures, and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ultimately, Adam's sin brought human death into the world. And as a result, every human was going to experience death. This was not the way God had set things up. Death was not part of the original plan. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were put out of the garden. They were banished from the garden. And the scriptures tell us why. In Genesis 3, verses 22, it says, And the Lord said, The man now has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So up until that point, they were allowed to eat from the tree of life and live forever. 
But because of their rebellion, God said no. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Death came on the scene. And every human that followed was plagued with death. So you have this entire population, you and me included, of people hounded by death and committing sins which would result in eternal death. See, sin separated them from the creator, the one from whom we all came and to whom we were all meant to return. Sin made a mess of things. Paul clearly describes the consequences of the one man's sin. Judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. Death reigned through the one man. The result of one trespass was condemnation for all people. Through one man's disobedience, all were made sinners. Because of the law, sin increased and sin reigned in death. Now I know that this life doesn't always feel bad. It doesn't feel that bad. In fact, for some of you, life is really quite great. It's quite wonderful. So wonderful, in fact, that there is no felt need for salvation, for a savior. It's a bit like those who set off that fateful day in 1912 aboard the luxury ship, the Titanic. Man, it had much to be impressed at. The first class accommodations were designed to be the pinnacle of comfort and luxury with a gymnasium and a swimming pool, smoking rooms, high-class restaurants and cafes, a Victorian-style Turkish bath, hundreds of opulent cabins. This is a lot like what our new church building is going to be like. It was a true marvel. It was the largest ship. No, it's not. I'm just. It was the largest ship of its time. But despite all that beauty and wealth and comfort, it was destined for destruction. The loss of life was enormous when it sank. And for some of us, we can feel like we're on a voyage on the Titanic. We have everything we want. We have comfort. We have employment and love. Why would we look for anything else? But like the Titanic... This life is destined for destruction. It will come to an end. And the question is, will you be saved when it all goes under? And for other of us, life can feel like the opposite of a luxury cruise. It's been hard. It's been painful. There have been times when any alternative to this life seems very, has seemed very attractive. That's because this life is broken. You know it. You've felt it, you've seen the underbelly of life and you want to get away from it. And this is what Paul is trying to describe to us in this passage. We inherited sin from Adam. Even before we sinned personally, we had a sin nature. We're all destined to die. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of it. And this is the second man, Jesus The second man. No, maybe you've experienced needing a rescuer. We used to have this big old Suburban, which we named the Black Pearl, uh, and it had some problems with it. One of the major problems was the gas gauge didn't quite work like it should. You'd fill it up and whoop, it would go to full, and that was great. And when it was empty, it would show empty. The problem was it would stay full continuously, Until it was empty. And then all of a sudden, you'd be driving along, all of a sudden, it would slam over to empty, and you knew you had like 15 kilometers left. So one time, I'm driving back from Revelstoke to Calgary, and we're just about the Northlander. That's about 45 minutes right between Revelstoke and Golden. And I I assumed that the last person to use the vehicle, I think it was one of my kids, I assumed (laughs) that they filled it up when they used it. There I was, I had three of my youngest kids, ages, uh, how old were they? Three to eight. And, um, and all of a sudden the gauge goes like this, boom. And I realized I got 13 kilometers now and I'm 45 minutes from Golden and Revelstoke. I don't know what to do. I knew I was in trouble. And uh, I prayed for a miracle. Uh, my expectations were a lot less. And sure enough, we ran out of gas. I needed a rescuer. Now, I know I wouldn't recommend this to anyone, but I found myself with my three young children hitchhiking along the Trans-Canada Highway. They thought it was the best adventure in the world. I felt like the worst father around. 
Fortunately, we found a rescuer. We picked us up, took us to Golden. We got a gas can, filled it up, then hitchhiked our way back to the Pearl. You know, I couldn't have done it on my own. I needed someone to help me fix the situation. And this second man, Jesus, is the one who came to set things right. He saw the problem and he came to the rescue. He was born to the Virgin Mary 2,000 years ago. Grew up in Palestine, traveling between Galilee and Jerusalem. He began his earthly ministry at the age of 30. He came healing and teaching and setting people free from the power of the devil. He performed miracles and served. He was humble and kind and full of love. His purpose in coming, though, was not just to be a great teacher or a benevolent leader. No, he came to accomplish so much more. And he knew the plight of all humanity. He knew that because of Adam, they were all destined for death and eternal separation from God. There was only one way they could be saved. Someone had to die in their place. Someone had to take all of their sins that they could never pay for and pay for them. And the only one big enough to accomplish this was God himself. You see, Jesus uh, is very different than the first man. The first man is created by God. The second man was the creator. The second man was God. Here's what it says in Colossians. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of his body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in him, all things might be reconciled to God. This is who Jesus is. And when Christ's blood was shed for us, incredible things happen. Paul lists some of them in our passage. Grace overflowed through Jesus. The gift of his sacrifice followed many trespasses and brought justification. Now people can reign in life through Jesus. The result of this one act of righteousness was justification that brought life to everyone. Through his obedience in going to the cross, all can be made righteous. When sin increased, grace increased all the more. And grace reigns in righteousness to bring eternal life. He did what no one else could do. When everyone else knew that we couldn't get there from here, Jesus put it into gear and made a way. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did wrong and got us into all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us all out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. All the sins of all the people for all time have been wiped clean because of Christ's one act of obedience. He went to the cross and died a perfectly innocent man. He took all of our sins on himself and made justification and salvation and restoration possible. I want to describe it this way. I want to draw it. And I've... In your bulletin, there's a piece of paper. It says Romans on the one side. If you flip it over, it says something about the bridge. I'd love for you to draw this with me, to practice this with me. So you find this piece of paper. Hope you got a pen nearby. Pull that out. Get a pen. And we're going to draw this diagram together. Because I think this explains, helps to explain the predicament that we're in and what Jesus did for us on the cross. So on the one side here, if you just draw a little stick person... This represents you and me and all of humanity, okay? On the other side here, he put God. Okay, now, God's plan was for us to be on the same page in relationship with each other, in loving relationship. He walked with Adam in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day, just talking about stuff, naming the animals and Wondering how things are going and what do you think of Eve? And Adam is like, thumbs up. They enjoyed their time together. But then sin came. You write sin down here at the bottom in the middle. Sin came. Adam rebelled against God. And when that happened, a great chasm was created. 
A great chasm. Now think of this. This looks pretty small here. But think of this chasm as the size of the Grand Canyon. There was no way now that Adam, us, could have a relationship with God because of this massive chasm caused by sin. Now some people think, oh, I'll just be good. If I'm really good, I can get to God. I just won't do a bunch of bad things. I'll do a whole bunch of good things, and I can get to God. Well, the problem is, if you imagine this like the Grand Canyon, and this is an Olympic jumper, like an Olympic jumper on steroids. And this person can jump, and also you have a normal person, uh, just like you or me, and maybe someone who just is just on crutches. Okay, all three of us are going to make a jump across the Grand Canyon. Crutches jumps first. I jump second. Crutches beats me. (laughs) And then Olympic jumper jumps. Where are we all going to end up? Down here, where none of us are going to jump the Grand Canyon. And it doesn't matter if you're Mother Teresa or if you're Adolf Hitler. None of us can jump, can bridge this gap between us and God. We can't do it. We can't get there from here. So we're in trouble. But then Jesus came. And I want you to draw a cross right here. Jesus came on the cross. He died for us. Took our sins upon himself. And he made a way. He made a bridge across this massive chasm. So suddenly, we can have relationship with God again. But there's one more step. Something very important that this person needs to do. What do they need to do? They need to cross the bridge. I can stand here all day, God's far over there, and I say, well, I guess there's a way now, but I'm not going to do anything about it. No, we need to walk across that bridge. And the way we walk, get across the bridge is by believing in Jesus and receiving him into our hearts. When we believe that Jesus' sacrifice for us is enough, and we trust him as the bridge, then we can walk across the bridge and and. This personal relationship with God is restored again. So I have a couple questions for you. Now that you have this little bridge diagram in front of you, or if you're looking up here, two questions. Where are you on this diagram? And where do you want to be? This is the most important questions you can ask yourself. Where are you? Where do you want to be? You've been given freedom to choose. Are you tired of the emptiness of this life? Are you longing for something more? Are you ready to have all your sins forgiven and your shame taken away? You can experience that today if you choose to believe in Jesus and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe your eyes are being opened to the fact that this life is not all there is. And while this life may be great uh, for you, you're coming to the realization that it will end one day. And you don't have a plan for what happens after. But you can experience the peace that comes in the truth that Jesus will make all things right. If you believe in him and receive him as your Lord and Savior, you can have the confidence of eternal life. Just like it says in John 1. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And this is the story of Easter. This is the great rescue. God himself became a human and died in our place. And he didn't stay dead. 1 Corinthians 15 says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Jesus is alive. He has conquered the power of sin and death. The enemy has lost that he has been defeated. Jesus has made a way where there was no way. And our part in the great plan of salvation is to believe and to receive him as our Lord and Savior. If you don't know Jesus personally, you can do that today. You can surrender all of your life over to him. The Bible teaches that Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. If we open the door to him, the door of our heart, he will come in. And be with us and eat with us. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. 
He's knocking on the door of your heart today. If you open that door, he will come in. See, he will not force you to love him. He won't kick the door down. He won't get his foot in the door and then push it open. Because he knows that love must always, always be given willfully. But if you will love him, if you will believe in him, you can become a child of God. You can be set free from the life of death that you were born into. You can cross over from death to life. You can get there from here through the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. Will you let the true meaning of Easter enter your hearts today? Jesus is waiting. He's given everything for you. And he longs for you to receive it. Let's close our time in prayer. As we pray, as we're quiet before God, see, I believe he rose again, that he's actually alive, that he's here with us in the room by his spirit. I'm going to ask some questions, some things for you to think about and to ponder. And I just ask you to, as I ask you these questions, let them resonate in your heart, in the quietness before God, see what he might say to you. Maybe you see yourself on the wrong side of the chasm. Sin has made a mess of your life. You're filled with guilt and tension and broken relationships. Mostly you feel a great emptiness within you and you know that you were meant for something more. What does Jesus want to say to you? Can you see the sacrifice he made? Can you hear him beckoning you to trust and believe in him? You know what, maybe today you've just decided to walk across that bridge for the first time. You've decided to surrender your life to Jesus and to trust that he will save you. The Bible says that you have become a child of God. This was all done through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What do you want to say to him? And what is he saying to you? Maybe you've already received the gift of Christ's sacrifice in your life some time ago, a year ago, 20 years ago. You know, this gift was meant to save you and to bless you, but it was meant for even more. It was meant so that you might be a blessing to others. Who is Jesus bringing to your mind that is still on the far side of the chasm with whom you can share his great love and the work he did on the cross? How else will they know if you don't tell them? What is Jesus asking you to do? Lord, we are grateful for the sacrifice you made for us on the cross. And we declare that you are greater than death. You are greater than the power of the enemy. Because you rose again. You conquered sin and death. You conquered it for each one of us. And there are some here in the room that haven't been living in that victory. They've been living in, in, uh, in failure and in, in being defeated. And Jesus, you want them to be free today. You want to give them eternal life that begins right now. Eternal life, living now, forever and ever. Thank you for what you did for us on the cross to make that possible. And Jesus, I pray that we would all draw closer to you today, receiving the incredible gift that you've given us. 
Lord, I ask that you would um, make us bold, that we would share this good news with, with anybody that we meet. Letting them know that you have, you have um, made it possible for them to experience life where only they've known death. You are great, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The closing song this morning speaks to God's amazing grace and his love and his blood poured out for us that we may have life with him. So I invite you to stand with us this morning as we enter into time of praise again and celebrate our risen king. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty so much stronger the king of glory the king above all
He's done what no one else can do. When there was no way, he made a way. You've been set free, my friends. Live in that freedom. If you would like to speak with someone, I would love to do that. There'll be others up here that would join me, elders and staff that would love to be able to talk with you, pray with you. Other than that, friends, um, here's what it says in Romans. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of God? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week. Go in peace. This is-